All right, today we're going to be looking at a spectrometer. It's a very interesting device that I have put together and is going to help out a many individual that is suffering from not knowing what concentrations of copper sulfate they have in their bath. So spectrometry is a, a way of being able to pass light through a known solution and the known solution will give you a reading. So the light goes in at 100% and then goes out the other side. And then there is a photo cell on the other side that measures the amount of light that is being absorbed. Okay, So if the light is 100% going in, but it's not 100% going out, there is a difference between those two. And that's the absorption of uh, light. And the small particles of copper sulfate do that. So it happens at a certain wavelength, however. So we're going to cover that in a video about what wavelength. And you're like, hey, this is just a box with a Shiva stone on top. What are you talking about? So in the box, in the box, there is a device that we're going to be building. Da -da. Da -da -da. Just like that. Now, um, I wanted to keep it as simple as possible. In other words, like this enclosure certainly doesn't have to be a box from Amazon. Um, I'm trying to keep it on the very inexpensive side, easy to build for people that have no understanding of electronics whatsoever. Uh, a true spectrometer is going to cost you a pretty penny. Okay, there's no doubt about it. But you can see there's a, a curve up here. Um, and if you are into this type of science, the curve is amazing. Uh, when it came off of this, and I was like, geez, that's pretty accurate. Uh, so I'm very, very uh, pleased with the results of this very low technology being able to produce such good, um, accurate results. There's no doubt. Okay, so for example, I have a, a known solution which we're going to be look, covering on how to make a known solution of copper sulfate. We're able to pass light through that and measure the amount of light. So we'll have different, this is a 1.25 molar. This is a 0.5 molar. See that one is darker than the other. And as they get darker, uh, they have more copper sulfate in them. But you can see that there's, not much of a difference between these two. So it's really hard to identify that with the human eye. That's what this thing does. Um, later on in the video, you're going to uh, be able to identify or see that there was a box version and an unboxed version. There was very little difference between the box version and unbox version. I'm gonna help you shop for some of these devices too. Uh, they're not hard to find. They're in they're in stock on Amazon, pretty cheap. This is a good gateway drug for those individuals that you know, like maybe they're getting burned out on electroforming, and they want to try to experiment on other regions. Um, this this D uh, ESP thirty two module is a really cool hobby on the side. That's uh, it's very well documented. And it leads to all kinds of crazy. So this is a, a, a really nerdy level for the direction I wanted to take. Um, I just want to kind of give you something that I've been playing with for a while. Uh, I've been holding on to the results to make sure that, you know, like, let's say I, I use it. You know, I actually use it. I, I don't just build it and just support it or um, flex it to you. I'll, I'll use it on several of my baths to try to see if I can make changes that are uh, a pretty significant change where I can go back to uh, the shiny part of having just the right amount of copper sulfate in bath. And if it's oversaturated, I know what to do. And if it's undersaturated, I know what to do now because I know how oversaturated it is or how undersaturated it is. I can make changes because I can make samples and then measure those samples against this curve. 
really cool stuff, right? It gets it gets a little unconfusing as I go on. So I'll leave you to the uh, version one of a spectrometer using an ESP32, and we'll have fun building it. So hope you enjoy. All right, so I took advantage uh, of knowing how to cut plexiglass in the next section, so I wanted to cover it. I went back and started editing the video and realized I didn't cover how to cut plexiglass. I just showed you these magical little things that were already cut. So here is plexiglass. It has a coating on it. You don't have to get the kind with the coating. You don't have to get optic brand. Um, I would just, you know, go to Lowe's, Home Depot, wherever, and get a piece of plexiglass. If it doesn't have the coating, you'd have to use a Sharpie marker, but you need a metal ruler that you need. And you just measure off, let's say, I'm going to say inch and a half, what I used. Do. Draw a line. You don't have to draw the line because you're going to be instantly cutting it. So you're going to use either an Olaf knife, I think they're called, boom, or any knife. Doesn't have to be super sharp either, by the way. So you watch your fingers. Okay, keep your fingers back and. Just score a line. I go about two to three times. Boom. Okay, nice scored line there. Okay, then you put it on the edge of a table. Try to get this in video. I'm putting my hand here so that like my thumb and my palm have equal play on it. So I'm trying to cover as much force distance right here. Okay. Then I'm going to hold down my other arm right about here. And then I'm going to just simply go like that. Okay. Pretty cool stuff, right? Boom. And now if you needed to cut the other way, you just measure it this way and snap, snap, snap. And you can snap as many. Sometimes you get bad results. Uh -oh. But um, that's all in the fact that, you know, your score line needs to be cut, right? I used a laser cutter to cut the samples that I have out. But you do not need a laser cutter. That's just a privileged nerd thing that I got. So don't think that you need one of those. That's how you cut plexiglass. So let's move on to the... Uh, Colvet making. All right, we're going to make a covet. Okay, this is uh, inexpensive covet in the fact that we have plexiglass that is non UV uh, protected, so you can pass UV light through it. Most plexiglass is that way. This is thin plexiglass. It is, mm, I want to say, a 32nd of an inch somewhere. 16th. Yeah, it's definitely a 16th. 16th of an inch. Does not matter, however. So if you have one eighth inch plexiglass, if you just go to like Home Depot, Bose, Menards, whatever it is, and you get yourself some plexiglass, it is fine. Uh, this is kind of like a inexpensive way to do this for what we are doing. It doesn't have to be as accurate as, as you might imagine. So I trap it between a known layer of, of um, microscope slides. You can use anything for this. I just like the glass because it stays cold. It's at a very even level. So I have five microscope slides. Again, you can use anything you want for this, but it has to have the same thickness. Okay. 
glue gun. Okay, all right, so what we'll do is start launching some glue in between these two planes on one side, and what we're gonna do is seal off the one end. Doesn't matter how thick this is. And you know you have it because you can see straight through it. That's a good indication that you got a good seal. Then I'm just going to allow that to dry. All right, so the first one's dry. I'll just show you how to bridge two pieces together uh, so that it's sealed correctly. So what we're gonna do is I'm going to move the microscope slides over like that, okay. I'll place the clip here. So now I have over here, and I'm going to heat this glue up using the tip. Okay. And I haven't began to inject anything into it yet, and now I'm just starting to. So you can see it where it's, it turned clear in that area. I'm still barely moving and there we go we'll start going across these slides I forgot to mention are two inches by one and a half does that matter absolutely not the only reason they're that big is because I figure by the time I get that much glue in there, I have a nice little window of the solution. If you are not really crafty, um, cut your pieces maybe two by two. It's a little bit safer. There we go. I shouldn't see any kind of, it should be clear right there and it's starting to harden. All right, now if you have gotten anything on the inside of one of these, just by accident, I would suggest before you make another bead to um, just kind of give it a once over with a Q-tip, dry Q-tip. It's a much easier clean if it has a big opening. All right, sweet. The outside doesn't really matter because we can clean it after the fact. All right, just like before, we heat this up. Start ejecting slowly. Move that tip right into that. Slowly eject. Once in a while, I'll just push back, just like a kind of weld. Boom. boom. All right, so for this first one that we're going to eject with water, um, you can use a syringe with the metal tip, or you can use a dropper it doesn't really matter what you use I just had a bunch of syringes um, we don't want to use the metal tip when it comes down to the copper sulfate versions because it could interact and get stuck especially if they're cheap and they're not pure stainless so I'm just taking uh, some water into my syringe Then I'm just going to eject some water. It's nice to have this one to zero out the device I'm going to show you how to build. Okay. I'm going to leave a little space at the top. Now certainly you, could, you can use this same 
Cavet if you wanted to over and over again. Again, it's really cool to have these already pre-made, to have on hand to make it so that you don't think that you're going insane uh, with settings and everything else. So once you make one of these, it's sealed. You set it off to the side. It'll last God only knows how long, to be honest with you, because there's, they're sealed with air and everything. So one of the things I would highly suggest is taking a Q-tip and just making sure there's no moisture at the very top. Just a little cotton swab thingy. Okay, and then hopefully I can get this caught on film. It's at a weird angle. Okay, so all I'm doing is heating one side, just like I showed you before. And then slowly just pumping this in. Okay, then once I get halfway, I'm gonna stop, turn the bus around, heat the other side. And then start going like this. And then overlap the two. Just like that. It will be messy. And I, on the top part one, I'll let it dry and then add just a little bit more on the top. Okay, put that in the helper hands, let it dry. And now we have our nice, clean, crisp, distilled water test subject. And the reason we have to make that one is because we have to take in effect uh, the glass. We have to take effect the water. Even if it's water, it still has a property to it. So, and so does the plexiglass. So your plexiglass could be thicker, you know, or my. It, but we have to have a distilled water version to rule out that in the test. All right, for this next part, uh, we're going to have to do some math. And I've got a visual aid here, too. Okay, so this has, this is a 200 milliliter beaker. Okay, it's kind of hazy, but it is clean. And just the fact that it's got <laughs> years of use on it. Um, so this has got a known value of 100 milliliters. Okay, I can fill this to 100 milliliters. Just Kind of get that in your head as far as like it's a beaker it has a hundred milliliters of of a volume of liquid okay cool so I'll put that in your head um, you also have a weight okay so I could take uh, put a cup on here this is a very small scale turn it on I can make sure it's tarred out, which is zero. And I could put copper sulfate in this cup and measure out grams, okay? So, now we have those two visual aids in our head. We can get started. All right, so to make a known solution, we just have to have uh, the ability to know how much copper sulfate pentahydrate, which is also called copper sulfate 2, is in the liquid. So there's copper sulfate and there's copper sulfate 2, which is the pentahydrate version, which already has a, a volume of liquid or H2O in it. So just just know that there's already liquid in the crystal and that's uh, why it's all fluffy like that. So we're definitely using copper sulfate pentahydrate.
So the molecular weight of copper sulfate pentahydrate is roughly two, two, four, nine point six nine, and it goes to six eight six nine. So it's, <laughs> at this point, you're not really worried too much about it. Two hundred forty nine point six nine is the molecular weight of copper sulfate pentahydrate. Sweet. Okay, that's a known value. You could look that up anywhere you want. All right, so we got known value. Now what's going to change is we're going to have to make about four known solutions. I would say if you really want accuracy though, you can go five, six, ten solutions, but in copper sulfate pentahydrate, you don't really need that much. I'm going to do three just as an example, and I would suggest at least five to six. Okay? So we'll start out one that's pretty simple. So we're going to go half a mole. So we're going to put point five. Okay? We have a known amount of solution. We're going to say 100 milliliters. Okay, we're going to put that over 1,000. Okay. Now we're going to times those two numbers together, and we're going to times it by the molecular weight. You're like, oh crap, there's a fraction. They showed me this in school. I hated math. It's not hard. To get rid of that fraction, we just do it. So one, 100 divided by 1,000. And it's just going to give me 0.1. So you don't even have to know this as long as you're using the same amount of liquid. But it's really nice to know the math. So 0.5 times... 0.1 times 249.69. And what is this? Well, let's, let's do that one out on a calculator. 0.5 times 0.1 times 249.69. So that equals 12. 0.484 and you're at this point you're going to get really hard to weigh that out so I would just cap yourself off at like 12.48 okay and this is going to be the grams that we're going to need to mix of copper sulfate to distilled water so you're just going to measure out 12.48 grams of copper sulfate and mix it with 100 milliliters of distilled water. And you'll have a 0.5 molar solution. And then you're going to trap that between the two planes of plexiglass, just like I showed you how to trap distilled water between two. And now we, we make increments of this. Okay, well, we could go 0.75. We could go one and continue with this out. The same thing, 0.75 times 0.1 times 249.69 equals, and you gotta just do the math on this one. So two, two, two. We change this number and we keep changing it. You're gonna hit a wall though, and the wall it's not really a wall, it's just the amount of uh, copper sulfate pentahydrate that actually dissolves in water easily enough. So I have I would say you would cap yourself off at 1.25, okay? At 1.25, about 1.3, um, it gets a little bit harder to get it to saturate into the liquid, into the water. 
because you need a lot of heat. So 1.25 will allow you to like just have hot water. But at 1.3 or 1.35, it's going to make it so you have to have absolutely 200 degree water. Like so, and to trap that between two panes of glass held together with hot milk glue, probably not a good idea. Fun stuff. So, your task now, <laughs> it's a lot of work, but it's going to be worth it in the end uh, because we're going to be able to now take samples of our bath and see where it's at. Is it undersaturated or is it oversaturated? All right, so to fast forward, just what I did. Here is a 0.5 mole. Here is a one mole. And here is a 1.25 mole solution. And then I have an unknown. Ooh. So this unknown came from a bath that sucks <laughs> it, it, what's going on with it who knows you know like we can all relate to that sometimes all right so this section of the video I'm going to cover just the components so later on I'm going to show you how to shop for these components because there's many places you can get these components um, there's many links on Amazon so rather than make uh, links below um, I've done that before, and what happens is usually they will go out of stock, and then everybody freaks out, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to show you how to shop rather than shop for you, okay? Let's go over some of the components here and kind of introduce you to them, and then later on I'll show you how to shop for them. So the first thing we're going to cover is the fact that you have these, uh, these are ESP32s. Boom, boom. They're, they look the same, right? They look absolutely the same. In fact, there's probably about 20 variations of these. Uh, you can see that this one is clearly labeled. Okay. And it's got these little numbers on it. And they're on the top. This is a wide variation. So you need a breadboard need actually three of these little guys. So these are smaller breadboards. So you're gonna have to buy a smaller breadboard. You'll need three of them. You'll need to stack it just like that and be able to plug in the unit. So you'll need three of those little breadboards. If you get the wider one, and if you get the narrower one, you can use just the long breadboard. So, Notice that now I have these open channels on both sides that I could plug wires in. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of them. It's not really worth. This is a very high dollar one. I think it's like 30 bucks. Where this one, you can buy three of them for like $9. I like this one. Um, I'll show you uh, in another thing about the Lowland 3D32. Um, it's overpriced because it does some stuff that you will never ever use. Okay. So um, it's kind of like the Cadillac of D32s. It's kind of a pain in the butt to deal with. That's why I'm showing you this one. I got three other ones, but I would stay away from this one unless you really want to go super nerdy later on. Okay. Stick with the cheaper variations that are labeled on the top and not just labeled at the bottom. I'll cover that in a video. It's all about, you know, the pin location and what you're looking for when you're buying this. All right, so three micro boards. I'll cover shopping for this thing later, but that is a D32. All right, what else? Okay, this is a potentiometer. I believe this is a 10K. I would limit it to 100 or 5,000. I'll show you a package that has a whole bunch of 
variations in it on Amazon. You don't need all the variations. I would stay away from the 10K and 100K. It was quite a pain to tune in the device with the 10 and 100K ones. I tried all. I tried a lot. I, I don't like the 10K. I like the 1K and the 5K. All right. So this is a photo cell. By the way, all the potentiometers work. Okay, so it doesn't matter which one you get. It's just a little bit of a tuning issue. Uh, but if you're patient, you, it, it does tune. This is a photo cell. They come in many sizes. Uh, this is a through hole device or a through mount onto a breadboard one. Um, that's all you need. There's sometimes you can get these with these big, huge... Uh, external power and everything else attached to them don't get that just get the single ones like this the cheaper inexpensive one the better all right a 10 ohm resistor i wouldn't just buy a 10 ohm resistor i would just buy a pack of resistors it's cheaper uh see the stripes on it brown black brown that's important. That indicates what ohm resistor it is. Okay. This is a 625 nanometer LED. They usually come that way. So you can see 620 to 625. Later on, I'm going to try to experiment with the 650 to 700 nanometers, but I ran the 625 throughout this whole video, and I'm very pleased with the results. You might hear me rant about having a 650 or 700, but I did like 625. So the wavelength of light is important because this wavelength interacts with the copper sulfate from anywhere from i would say 600 to all the way up to 700 i just want to try up the the upscale version of this to see what happens and that's it so not many components uh again you know like let's say you want to play around with it later on you'll have a breadboard that you can play around with it um all these parts are inexpensive you're probably looking at probably 25 to 30 dollars of parts to build a spectrometer that could roughly cost, you know, like up to like seven to two thousand dollars, seven seven hundred to two thousand dollars if you buy one. So, not a bad trade off. All right, let's go into the rest of the video, and then I'll cover shopping on Amazon for this stuff and talk about it a little bit more. All right, so you're also going to need a box of twenty two gauge wire. I would. This is 22 gauge solid wire. And it comes in many colors. I would get the accessory pack where it comes in many colors. This is pretty easy to find. Uh, reason 22 gauge because it fits into the breadboard very easily. You just, you know, you make these jumper wires. You can make them any length. You just uh, cut off the ends like that and they fit into the little breadboard. Boop. You can jump them all around and be as neat as possible or just as messy as possible, but it's all about um, just fitting in the breadboard correctly, and 22 gauge fits nicely into breadboards. All right, so before we get started um, with some of the software, I'll show you how to shop for some of this stuff. Uh, I'm on Amazon right now, and I'll help you shop. So what we're looking at is the ESP32. This uh, microcontroller looks like this. Yeah. There's different variations of it, and some have different pinouts. See how pin 34 is right here, okay, on this model? Uh, this is the model you want. Um, and you can look over here, and you'll see that pin 34 is right here it's 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 the, the fifth one down okay this is a good indication upon which ones you're getting 
Now, there's tons of analog connections here that we could choose from. I'm just showing you that this is a like-minded one by using that pin as a way of reference. So these little green ones are analog. That means it can uh, handle calculations from an analog sensor like that cell, photo cell. All right, so what about all the other ones? Let's look how many there are. So here's the ESP32, if you typed it in, boom, boom. There is so many, right? So many. Well, that's, uh, that. if you follow that reference I just gave you, you can always buy the right one. Um, stay away from this one, you'll want it because it has a little screen, but it's hard to solder. Yes, it's impossible to solder that thing, so even if you're a solder master. So this one right here is one you should stay away from, unless you know what you're doing. Uh, it's got a battery. It is a nice little machine. It's got print on the bottom. Okay. You'll have to look at the pinout to find out what is the analog. And it will not match. Okay, so stay away from that one. So many. Oh, here's a nice one. See? Here's the pinout. Okay, what about the uh, 34? Yes, and it's ADL6, so it's the these two numbers match. So this one would be a good one. These are matching. The ADOC6 is matching with GPI034. Other than that, it's a, it's a good microcontroller. So some of these are no, why there are so many is because uh, it's it's pretty much an open game for the design. Uh, you can just own a company that can make these things, and whoever o owns the one that has the least of amount of energy draw wins. That's how it works. But we don't care about energy draw for this application. We compare, we want processing power. All right. So that's the ESP thirty two. And next, uh, what about the confusion about the potentiometer? All right, so tons of potentiometers. Um, they all function about the same way. Uh, here's these ones, the metal ones, like I showed you. And I like those because they have a little metal one. You know, they, it feels good to turn them. That's all. But these will work just fine. Now, there is... 10k ohm okay and if you look down here below there's going to be an assortment pack i think somewhere so they look like this but there's a whole bunch of them and might have been bought out right here okay so these are 10k Ah, uh, here we go. Here's a nice one. So this potentiometer kit comes with 1K, 5K, 10K, and uh, 100K. What's nice about this one is it lets you play around a little bit more. And you can, it, the more K you get, uh, the finer adjustment you get. But as you go up in the 10K region, it's really sensitive. So the 1K might be sufficient. Um, I would say 4K is the minimum you should use. And these two are just going to be something you play with. So I would start with 5K and work your way up. I don't know what the one is that I showed you in the video just a second ago, but we'll find out. They're not labeled very well. So I'm pretty sure it's going to be a 5K. Hopefully. I'll show you what adjustments look like based upon those. All right. The photo cell. Um. Okay, you're going to get all these crazy things for photo cells. And what we want is the small one. Yeah, these things. Yep, those work. These work. Don't get this. These work. 
Yeah, we don't need the processing. We don't need the power of these. These will work just fine for what we're doing. So four dollars. Um, how about that? Six hundred and fifty nanometer LED. So when you type that in, what's going to happen is it's going to lead you to something like this, and it's not going to show too much. But if you type in uh, LEDs assortment. you get this and then you get all kinds of leds for about the same price but now you have to know what you're looking for so i'll show you let's say this one right here um it will show you these but will it give you the nanometers and no it does not okay. but don't buy that one but this one here we go so the red one in the pack, it goes up to 625 nanometers. That's a good start. So we can go with this pack and look at, you get all these colors that you can play with later on, 599. So that's how you shop for the LED is you just look for the one with nanometers. If they have a 700 one, it's, that'd be awesome. Uh, 700 would be kind of rare. I'm telling you that right now. So you'd probably have to go to Mouser or uh, element 14 to get it. So. The resistor is easy. I would just get an assortment of resistors. They're so cheap. And you're looking for the brown, black, brown. Which is... 10 ohm, just like I thought. Cool. I think that's it. So that's how you shop for this stuff. Pretty easy. You can't go wrong. Um, now that we have a list of things that we need, i also provide them in the list below, but just in case they're out of stock and you say, hey, these are out of stock, that's how you shop for them. All right, so let's get started with this, okay? It's a pretty easy build. Um, all I did was bend this like that. Again, you might want to make this an enclosed box thing. You might want to add this, make it a little bit prettier in the long run. This is just the breadboard variation of it, so you can get started. So you would place this photo cell on your breadboard. And it goes like that. Well, it doesn't matter as long as like one row is being taken up here. Okay, this row and this row. You can stick it anywhere really, but uh, make sure that it's got this channel between the two. Okay, we got our potentiometer. Okay, I'm going to stick that up here. It's got three prongs, so we have to know what channels we're taking up, or what rows, so we'll have to look at that here in a sec. Okay, I always kind of use, and I got a color method, um, I'll use yellow for data, okay, so in this case, Plug that into my photo cell channel and this into D34, which is my analog channel on my ESP32. D34. All right, so in other words, so this whole row is kind of, if you're new to electronics, this whole row is connected. So this is kind of a way to, so you can think about it, soldering wires together. So now these two wires are soldered together. Not really, but that's what a breadboard does. Allow you to play around with things without soldering them together. All right, so we got that. So 
So I got an, a red one for power. In this case, we're gonna go three volts. So we're just going to plug that into our channel. Oh, and if you get the bigger breadboard, so you see this big gap, this channel and this channel are not connected, by the way. So I'm starting this on the red on this end. And so now this whole row right here, this whole row right here is going to be three volts. And I could plug as many things as I want into that three volts. In this case, I'm going to make three volts over here to run to this channel to get the whole row to be three volts. What? <laughs> All right, don't worry, there's labels. So this first pin says 3.3 volts. Okay, now I'm gonna run that over to any one of these pins. Now the three volts is this whole row of red. Cool, I'm gonna use this side for ground. All right, how do I do that? Well, I find ground. In this case, it's labeled G-R-N-D, ground. You see that pin, that hole? And then over here, I'll plug it into any of the blue ones. Now this whole row is ground. So I kind of think about this side being my positive side and this side being my negative side. Sweet, sweet. Still with me? Hopefully. Oh, I forgot a component. No. Yeah. Um, so your, your component, one more you're going to need is a resistor. I would suggest just buying a whole pack of resistors. Okay, in this case we want the brown, black, brown. I believe this is 10 ohms. Brown, black, brown. Uh, this will make it so that this light doesn't blow and doesn't blow out, because we the amperage is just a little too high for three volts. So this little resistor protects this guy. All right. Sorry, I didn't add that to the list. I remember when we had Radio Shack, you could run back and forth to get new resistors, and I would like do all these cool tutorials from other people. And I would always have to go right back to Radio Shack. They don't have that anymore, but it was my favorite store as a kid. All right, so now we hook up the potentiometer, okay? All right. So a potentiometer kind of works like this. One prong, any prong on any side, doesn't matter. One prong is going to be ground, the other one's going to be power, and the middle one is going to be the variable. All right, so we just have to make sure that we hook this up to a ground. In this case, I use the G and D on the other side. Okay, so that when I slide this in, one is going to be ground. The other side needs to be power. I see something on the other side there. Okay, good, look at that. I hooked it to the three volts. So now I got a channel, black, red, and the middle one is going to be my variable. So that's going to be, in this case, green. So 
Sweet. Now that I have my wires set, I can set that in there and have you easily understand how that works. You can see how confusing that gets sometimes, but it's very easy. As I turn this knob, I get a different variation of resistance. Kind of like uh, how you change your uh, settings on your electroforming bath. It has that knob too. How we change our amperage. All right, so that was the hard part, really, to be honest with you. What we just did is, is so now we have this photo cell that's hooked up to a microprocessor, and what we're going to do is broadcast light through a known solution. So now we just need the light on the other side. Now what I do is, because this might change depending on who's making it and how many micro slides that you're using, microscope slides, you could say, well, I just need it to sort of touch. And here is how an LED works. See how there's like a long leg and a short leg? The long leg is positive and the short leg is negative. So again, this is my positive negative. I'm going to put the long leg like that. Okay, so I got long leg on one side, short leg on the other, and they're in relatively the same channel. All right. So I don't want the full amperage to go through this LED. The red LEDs are very, very snowflakey. Uh, they need a lot of protecting. Okay, so I do this. I do this. And I'm doing a bad about resistors and the makers of resistors don't use 22 gauge wire. Why? They, I don't know. So this is not 22 gauge wire. It fits kind of sus in there, but you can see it's in the same channel and it goes over the negative. Leaving my positive to be hooked up on the other side. So here I'll do a little zoom camera thing, move this out of the way and kind of show you the whole thing. All right, we got a positive hooked up to the positive longer lead of the LED, the negative on the other side. Here's the resistor, and it's running over to the negative channel. We have a negative being ran over to the ground of the microprocessor, labeled GND. We have this green wire, which is the wire from the potentiometer. It's being plugged into the yellow wire, which is D34 on the microprocessor. One side of the photocell, and then the middle of the potentiometer. Boom. Cool. We got the three volts running from this channel to the photo cell. And then we got this, which gives it three volts running over to the microcontroller. This is the ground, and this is the positive, hooked again to three volts and ground. And we have this black wire that's running over to ground, in case I didn't cover that one. I can also make a schematic for this. Maybe. So that's all we need, really. A known value of light, a photocell. Now we need some data to push through it in order to measure how much light is going through. So uh, at this point, it's on one side we have 100% of the light, and on this side is the variable of light that's transmitting through and being measured. And it doesn't matter what the numbers get pushed out here because it's just a plot on a graph. That's the beauty of it. 
That is the absolute beauty of it.